The German-born American psychiatrist Hilde Bruck published a book that would be perhaps the most important work of her career in 1978. The book was called The Golden Cage, and it drew the attention of the medical world towards a problem she demanded to be taken seriously, eating disorders. In 1983, the world was shocked to learn about the death of the young and famous Karen Carpenter, whose heart gave out due to a complicated history of diet issues. Welcome to Nutty History. Today we are looking back at the obscure and tragic history of eating disorders and people who suffered from it in ancient times. Death is the only release. For some ancient cultures, poor dietary habits were considered attempts to get closer to the gods, such as the Vedic religion and its offshoots in the Indian subcontinent. As early as the 6th century BC, adherents of Jainism in India regarded Santhara, or fasting to demise, as a purifying religious ritual, particularly for men. In fact, meditating while fasting in an extreme fashion was quite prevalent among ancient Indian sages, if their texts were to be believed. According to these tales, some did it to achieve nirvana, the state of absolute soul purification and enlightenment, or moksha, that is, escaping the cycle of reincarnations and becoming one with the singularity that is considered as the ultimate shapeless god in these religions. Emperor Chandragupta, founder of the Mauryan dynasty, ended his life in 297 BC by fasting himself to his end. Some Jains still chose to take the vow of Salikana, an ascetic to slowly withdraw themselves from food and water by having one less morsel of food and one less sip of water every day. Jainism shares many beliefs with Buddhism and Hinduism, but is arguably a stricter interpretation of their various doctrines. The idea is that by withdrawing from the world in this way, you are consciously seeking to lighten the soul. It's sort of an end-of-life cleaning where you give away your material property, say goodbye to your loved ones, and are expected to apologize to every person you have ever wronged. Speaking of ascetic, the word has Greek origins, and Hellenistic records also offer us the earliest historical depictions of people experiencing symptoms of eating disorders consistent with modern-day perceptions of these ailments. Isocrates, not to be confused with another great philosopher, Socrates, malnourished himself to his end because he blamed himself for the rise of Philip, Alexander's father, which led to Greece being defeated by Macedonia. Philetus was another philosopher who ignored his nutritional needs just for the sake of having more time to argue with people and eventually succumbed because of not eating enough. Greece was also home to vomitorium, venues for lavish excessive parties where people would eat not according to how much their belly could hold, but to their heart's content, and then some more. They were able to do so by puking back what they ate and continuing gorging, which were obvious symptoms of bulimia and binge eating. However, the stories of ancient Greeks and later Romans overindulging in gluttony by performing technicolor projectile flaring yawns sort of go against the idea of how bulimia and binge eating are caused by stress and anxiety. Acts of vomitorium seem to be influenced by greed and pleasure, not duress. Also, modern historians have put forth enough evidence against the possibility of vomitorium being an actual thing, and they could be entirely fictitious, imagined by some twisted mind interested in history. Ancient Egyptians drew hieroglyphics that depicted their use of monthly purges to avoid illness. Ancient Egyptian healers believed that regurgitating food would help in getting rid of elements in the body that could cause diseases. Persian medical manuscripts and Chinese scrolls originating in early dynasties also describe ailments that are very similar to modern eating disorders. Even ancient tribes of Africa also describe the stories of men who fasted too long during famines to conserve food for children. These men struggled to get back on a regular healthy diet after the famine was over. Many of them perished, being unable to eat healthy any longer. The Spectacles of Binge Eating Disorders after the Great Famine of 1315 to 1317, food became an extremely valuable substance in Europe acquiring a mythic value. A series of cool rainy summers led to devastating crop failures across the continent, causing the prices of crops to rise exponentially. A quarter of wheat, beans, or peas was priced at 20 shillings post-famine in comparison to the price of 4 shillings before the natural calamity. The moisture in the air also made it difficult to boil salt water, which led to a shortage of salt and therefore meat became harder to preserve without it. Proper meals became the stuff of fantasy and fairy tales, a luxury. However, before this famine, cases of royalty and the wealthy overindulging in food weren't unheard of, such as the case of King Henry I of England, who died because of eating too much vampire fish. 
food became a status symbol for kings like Henry VIII of England and Louis XIV of France, who ate so much that new designs of clothes were invented just for them. In fact, Louis XIV is credited for founding the fashion industry as we know it today. People visited the palace of Louis XIV to watch the king dine in amazement, not only because of the quality and variety of food that they wouldn't find elsewhere, but also because of his voracious appetite and how he gorged so much food in one sitting, again and again and again. The man had a stomach three times the size of an average adult human. The successor of Henry VIII, Queen Victoria, also drew the attention of physicians towards her diet simply because she couldn't have enough of it. Like Louis XIV, variety and quantity mattered a lot to her. She would at least like to have a taste of everything on the table, even if she won't eat every course in its entirety. Her personal doctor remarked that she was built like a barrel for being short, stout, and obese by modern standards. Interestingly, while Queen Victoria suffered from binge eating disorder, Sir William Gow, the then physician to England's royal family, was the first to characterize anorexia as a disease different from religious hysteria or biological eating problems. As a child, Victoria was subjected to a vigorous regime of controlled eating. Her dinner might have consisted of only bread and milk. The young Victoria vowed to eat mutton every day when she grew up, and she certainly showed no intention of depriving herself once she reached adulthood. Her appetite also showed up in her colonization policy and her bedroom. Victoria and Albert's passion and love has been a matter of speculation and amazement for historians as much as her postnatal trauma that made her an awful mother to her kids. While she was feasting on gorgeous and exotic dishes, she made sure personally that her children and grandchildren were fed the plain roasts and broths that she viewed as appropriate for the nursery. Basically, she passed her trauma to her children. Her nine pregnancies also were quite stressful because they kept her away from a lot of her favorite foods and her favorite Prince Albert, which also didn't do any favor for her kids. The Fear of Food in Edo, Japan Japan closed itself from the outside world in the Edo period and the impact of an isolated culture and social restrictions had psychological consequences. Two distinct sorts of eating disorders developed during this period, Fushoku Byo and Shinsen Ro. 50 known cases were reported in Edo between 1603 and 1867, but the general opinion among historians is that these disorders were more common across Japan. Fushoku Byo was characterized by a loss of appetite similar to anorexia nervosa, while Shinsen Ro was characterized by a fear of food. Like the West, these ailments were more prevalent among women than men. During the Edo period, thinness was considered to be ideal for women. This was reflected in popular art and literature, which often depicted beautiful women as being slender and delicate. Such cultural pressure to be petite and demure may have contributed to the development of Shinsen Ro in some women. Not only that, active dietary restrictions on women were quite common in a society where women had to live in constant fear of their male guardians. Such discipline can have adverse effects on the psyche. These restrictions were often based on traditional beliefs about what was considered to be healthy or unhealthy for women to eat. For example, women were often discouraged from eating certain foods, such as meat and fish, as they were believed to be too heavy or stimulating. These dietary restrictions may have made it difficult for some women to get the nutrients they needed, which could have contributed to feelings of anxiety and fear about food. Not to mention, this was the Middle Ages of Japan, and lack of hygiene could often cause food poisoning, which wouldn't have helped people about making bold choices for dinner or just being scared of it. Even in the 20th century, it took years of research, study, and acceptance to establish eating disorders as a serious health issue. But gladly, the taboo has been lifted, and our future generations may eat better if we do not destroy agriculture entirely. When a disorder was considered good? Within the Christianization of the Roman Empire, anorexia also repurposed itself. Wealthy Roman ladies of the post-pagan Christian era, acting under spiritual direction, sometimes malnourished themselves to prove their contempt for the body, which was considered evil. The first recorded case of anorexia occurred in an upper-class Roman woman, Blasia, who was a member of a spiritual group led by St. Jerome and passed away due to starvation. Her behavior was driven by her Gnostic religious beliefs. This sort of spirituality-driven ascetic for self-starvation was labeled as anorexia morabilis or holy anorexia. This religious act created a whole new classification of people suffering from EDs called the fasting girls. As you can imagine by the name, almost all of the victims of anorexia mirabilis 
were women who were deeply involved with religion, such as young girls studying theology or Catholic nuns. In the 12th century, Marie of Oini went to great lengths to cause herself physical pain so that she could experience suffering like how Jesus Christ had. She deprived herself of sleep and food, and when she did eat, which was very little, she favored very stale bread. In the 14th century, Catherine of Siena survived only on the food that constitutes the Holy Eucharist. Catherine was known to insert sticks into her throat to activate her gag reflex and induce vomiting, as someone with bulimia nervosa would do. This sort of behavior was also incentivized by local churches venerating these women as martyrs and awarding them sainthood posthumously. When this sort of thing became a trend, the church tried to pull back and discourage such dangerous fasting, but the damage was done. Sufferers have been known to defy the orders of their religious superior to cease fasting, and their refusal to eat sometimes preceded their involvement in religious activities. The King with a Curse for better or worse, in the modern world, eating disorders have been in the limelight because of celebrities suffering from them. There was a time when people looked at Freddie Mercury and the Olsen twins and speculated about their EDs, EDs meaning eating disorders. But in current times, the taboo about these issues has been lifted. Icons like Taylor Swift are progressive to talk about their former anorexic tendencies. Surprisingly, things were not so different hundreds of years ago. Genius mathematician Hypatia of Alexandria, Queen Mary of Scots, Elizabeth I, Eleanor of Aquitaine and Aspasia, wife of Pericles, had been speculated to suffer from one or the other ED in their lives. But the earliest possible inclination of an eating disorder comes from Mesopotamian texts. Gilgamesh was an early hero and ruler of the Mesopotamians, whose legends appear to be the precursors to the stories of the Greek hero Heracles, and the mythic founder of the English kingdom and identity, King Arthur. He is mostly famous for being a great ruler and battling terrible monsters for gods in his stories but the poems about his adventures also signal towards the PTSD he endured from these harrowing battles and how they affected him. After his battle with Og of Kish, Gilgamesh was described as having cheeks so sunken in his face that you could make out the shape of his skull, clearly a sign of weight loss. In the mid-90s, psychoanalysts discerned how trauma and mood disorders could be triggers for anorexia among hypermanic functioning subjects, such as the character of Gilgamesh. There's a fair amount of debate about Gilgamesh being a real person or not, and of course his fantastical adventures with gods and monsters were fictional. But they very well could be hyperbolic representation of the trauma endured by real Mesopotamian leaders and soldiers because of harrowing experiences of war. It means even back in the earliest days of human civilization, there was a basic understanding of eating disorders. This was a time when every possible phenomenon and element known had a god associated with them in almost every pantheon. Obviously, in such cases, the eating disorders were regarded as a manifestation of God's wrath, a byproduct of curses or possession by evil spirits. The Cost of Modesty The high medieval era was a tough period for women, who experienced the worst social status as the church rose in power in Europe and built upon the gender divide across Europe that was laid down in the ancient Greek and Roman societies. Women were completely subjugated by their male guardians, whether they be fathers, husbands, or priests. They were expected to follow a strict sense of code of morality, modesty, and piety. This also began to reflect in their clothes too. It became imperative for women to conceal their specific body parts, which was pretty much everything, as according to church or authorities, not doing so would make them seem promiscuous or provocative. Perhaps this fashion trend also played a huge part in causing eating disorders among women of medieval times. In the Middle Ages, young women were suffering from eating disorders for a completely opposite reason, to stay unattractive. Back then, broad hips and a plump physique were considered the beauty standards and signs of fertility. Wilgit Fortas of Portugal was a legendary Portuguese infanta who took a vow of never to be in bed and began to not eat to avoid marriage. She even prayed to become ugly. Interestingly, her likeness has survived as a two-foot-tall wooden figure made by a Flemish carver around the year 1520 that is now on display at Gwinnett Museum and Art Gallery in Bangor. The statue immediately demands your attention towards the beard on the face of Wilgefortis, despite the fact that the rest of her statue appears feminine. The legend goes that she grew a beard because of her prayers to become unattractive. Thanks for watching Nutty History. If you enjoyed the video, please share, like, subscribe, and comment on what other nutty subjects you would like for us to cover.